Welcome to our channel, listen to my story. Please, like, share and subscribe. Hey, my name is Anne. It was the summer break before college, and as a graduation kind of celebration and before each and everyone went to a different college, my best friends and I decided to go on a fancy summer vacation to one of the most beautiful places on earth. At least that's what I think, to Hawaii. I was in my room daydreaming about wearing those cool coconut bras while enjoying an exotic juice, maybe even doing a hula dance, and then my best friend Kim called and burst my coconut bubble. She suggested that since we're off to a whole new stage of our lives, we may as well get a complete makeover. I thought she meant we should go shopping or something, but no, she said we should go to the hair salon and get new haircuts and maybe even dye our hair. I admit that I was overly excited about the whole thing, so I said yes. My normal hairdresser was on annual leave. She has always cut my hair exactly how I describe it. I love her. However, she has been gone for a while, and we couldn't wait any longer for a haircut, so I made an appointment with another hairdresser at the same salon. On a side note, Kim is blonde, while I'm a brunette. I know this info might not sound useful, but it will come in handy throughout the story. Kim and I drove to the hair salon, the place looked extra fancy, the kind of place you would trust. We went inside all giggly like we were 12, we were actually 18 at the time. Anyways, we were greeted by a really nice lady. That lady said that Kim should get highlights and I should go for the same plus going blonde. I was skeptic, but who cares, it's summertime. The lady put bleach all over my head and went to do Kim's hair. So, after 15 minutes, my scalp started burning like crazy. So I called the nice lady and she said it was time to wash the bleach. As she was washing my head, her smiley face went poker. Chunks of my now orange hair were all over the sink. Kim looked at me and her eyes got as big as my head. The lady asked me not to freak out and that she could cover the bald spots with a really short haircut. The lady asked me not to freak out and that she could cover the bald spots and so she started cutting my hair, so far so good. Then she snips a huge section out of the front of my hair saying that she was framing my face. At this point, it was too late to say anything. The haircut was just hideous, not me at all, and especially not what I asked for. So I told her that I hated it. She felt really bad and I started to tear up because it was seriously so ugly. And now that I was stuck with a really bad haircut, I tried to calm myself that maybe the color will turn out okay. And then she put the dye on my hair, and it turned my hair green. The only solution now was to become a redhead, and that was just a no for me. I don't have the complexion of a redhead. Our boyfriends were actually going to pick us up from the salon, and just imagining the look on Nick's face made me cry and laugh at the same time. Rachel played it really cool, and even her highlights did not go so well, but that incident was just one of a kind. I ended up with the weirdest hair color ever. It was like I was half mermaid, half dragon. This did not stop us from enjoying our summer break though. It was actually a good source of jokes for a long, long time. This is Tina and this is a story about me and my biological mother. My mother is sitting in the cafe of a garden center, staring at her cup of tea. I'm over the other side of the shop looking at some strawberry preserves. I want to attract her attention, but the word mom sticks in my throat. I use it so infrequently. Instead of calling out, I just walk over and show her the jam. Ever since I left home 15 years ago, the relationship between my mother and me has worsened. In hindsight, it was never very good to start with, but it's taken 15 years of counseling and soul searching to realize that. The fact of it is that my mother and I don't like each other much. We don't hate each other, we're just sort of indifferent. There, I've said it, indifferent. Saying it feels like committing some sort of crime. My mother and I live hundreds of miles apart, and in the case of most of my friends, this should mean that visiting home should be a time of joy and excitement. Instead, they are weekends of tense, polite conversation, both of us desperately searching for something in common to talk about. And that is usually what she's currently watching on television. As a 20-something woman, I'm constantly surrounded by reminders that my mom should be my best friend. Advertising aimed at my demographic features, glamorous, youthful mothers going to the salons with their best friend daughters. 
because it's all so alien to me, I tend to become a little bit fixated. I tend to look beyond the principal plot lines of films and become obsessed with the parts that involve a mother and a daughter for a large loving family headed by a quirky matriarch. When the film Mamma Mia came out, I went to see it with a girlfriend for a bit of a laugh. It was mainly about love affairs between Meryl Streep and her exes. As I watched, I was as always bewildered by the apparently natural bond that mothers and daughters have on screen. Another film. It's complicated, again with Meryl Streep, has a plot that hinges on her post-divorce relationship with her ex-husband. But the highlights for me? The way her children clustered around her and the way she reacted when they all came back to visit. Though I know it's not just on screen. My friend Susie has the same exact sort of relationship with her mom. It baffles and fascinates me. They talk every single day, sometimes more often, and tell each other everything. I didn't have an unhappy upbringing. I wasn't a happy child, but that wasn't down to child abuse or neglect. I was well clothed, fed, and I even had ballet lessons. I went to university, paid for by my parents, and I knew and I still know that there's always somewhere to stay if I need to. But my mother and I never had the sort of closeness I saw in my friends' relationships. They would go shopping or share secrets. They would tell their moms things about their lives. The one time I tried to ask my mother about her teenage years, she told me to mind my own business. And so I did. I grew up minding my own business and she minded hers. I left home as soon as possible and met my now husband at university and he quickly stepped into the role of best friend and emotional support giver. I made enduring friendships, most of which I believe to be unconditional. Most of my friends believed me to be a loving and caring individual and I know I could turn to any one of them in an emergency, and them to me. Yet, I cannot remember the last time my mother and I hugged, even though I hug my friends all the time, and the very thought of it makes me cringe. My mother is the last person I go to in a crisis. She is certainly the last person to whom I would tell a secret or a problem. And if I'm honest, I don't need to anymore, as I have my own friends now. But my lack of a close friendship with her bothers other people a lot. When I say that I don't have a close relationship with her, they ask whether we fight a lot. But no, I don't recall ever having a fight with my mother. That would entail caring enough to bother. I used to go through phases of worrying about it and trying to repair the damage. But all the while, I was aware that I was doing it for other people. I visit infrequently, but I visit. I do it not so I can see her, but if I'm honest, so her neighbors and family can see me visiting. A few years ago, before I realized I didn't care anymore, I called her up and asked whether we could sort it out. Her answer told me everything I needed to know. Sort what out? I stopped bothering from that moment on. Now my principal concern is explaining to people why I don't see her that often. And I feel guilty for not really having a good enough reason. My parents weren't divorced, my father died a few years ago. There has been no huge family dispute, there's no big skeleton in anyone's cupboard, well not mine anyway. I recently went to see a nurse for a routine appointment, and she asked a host of questions about my mother. Eventually, I had to confess that I didn't know half the answers. She asked whether I could find out. My heart sank as I imagined having to give away a detail of my life such as why I was going to the nurse to my own mother. Mother's Day is a nightmare. Trying to find a card that doesn't say my mother is my best friend or the best mother in the world or my heroine is not easy, let me tell you. Others try to fix it for me. Why don't you book a spa weekend for your mom? The very thought of my mother agreeing to or enjoying something like that is just laughable. Or they ask, why don't you go for counseling? This would be all well and good. 
if she would ever condone the idea, but it implies a relationship that needs to be mended. Why does it need to be fixed at all? Were my mother a woman I had met on a train and chatted to for half an hour, she would be one of the last people in the world I would want to talk to for a further half hour. If she wasn't my mother, she would be someone I groaned about having to spend any time with. I simply grew up and discovered that I didn't like my mother as a human being. She's not like me. She's self-obsessed, not interested in others, thoughtless and incapable of genuine warmth. She has no concept of giving love to receive love and has never asked me a single meaningful question about my life or career. Some people might feel that I have a duty as a daughter to be there for my mother, that it's down to me to repair our relationship, but because of the way she's raised me, I don't feel there is a relationship to repair. I wish my mother no harm, and if she were in trouble, I would help her like a shot. But I would also be there for any of my neighbors and the old man who swears at people from the bus stop across the road. I don't believe in ghosts, evil spirits, haunted houses, metaphysics, etc. I only believe in science and facts. But sometimes things happen that shred all your beliefs. I want to introduce myself. I'm Lisa. I'm 14 years old. I live with my mom, dad, and grandmother. And they're all very proud of me. I'm the leader of the science club at school, and I've been the perfect student for the past two years. My hobbies are reading, watching educational videos, and learning. I like to discuss matters with rational people, not those who believe in myths, aliens, ghosts, and other such nonsense. I personally think these people have mental issues. One morning, my grandmother passed away. I was sad for a long time because I missed her so much. On the day of her funeral, the whole city must have come to say goodbye. While the priests were praying, I noticed something peculiar about one of the graves in the graveyard. After the prayer ended, I approached the grave in question to investigate. There was some weird writing on it. Then, a wispy, transparent, smoky figure appeared out of nowhere. It said to me, Do not get closer to Donna Median's grave. Beware. I shivered slightly and asked the apparition who Donna was. And it replied, Who was she? She was an evil witch who liked to scare people. She was burned at the stake as a witch. But before her death, she swore a curse that if anyone ever approached her grave, her ghost would haunt that person to the day they die. I did not laugh at the apparition's warning. Instead, I turned and returned home, thinking about what had happened. On a sudden defiant impulse, I decided to visit that grave. That night, to see for myself if the curse was real. I took my dad's flashlight and wore a raincoat. It was pitch black outside. The place was horribly unsettling at night, but I wasn't worried at all. It's not like it was real, right? I entered the gate to the sound of howling dogs and meowing cats. My blood ran cold, and a sudden chill ran through me. I turned on the flashlight and began searching for the grave. My hands were trembling so badly I'd drop the flashlight several times. Sometimes I would step on something crunchy, and I would shine the light downward, only to see that I had stepped on an insect. Sometimes I'd see a cat here and there. Then suddenly, I heard an eerie sound close by. I froze, not daring to move. Slowly, I pointed my light towards the sound, and gasped as my light illuminated a dark, shadowy figure. It was about my height, and dressed all in black. I spun around and fled as rapidly as my faithful feet could carry me. I dove into bed, but I didn't sleep at all that night. I even left the lights on. The next day, when I woke up, I asked my dad if graveyards had ghosts, and he wondered why I would ask such a question. I was embarrassed and laughed to hide my fear. I told him that I was just curious. That was all. Dad looked at me suspiciously, but continued. I've heard stories, he said, that some people have seen a ghost of a girl from time to time beside Donna Median's grave. I felt my heart sink, and I asked slowly, Is she about my height and dressed in black? He replied, Yes, that's how I've heard the ghost described. How in the world did you know that? 
I looked down casually and answered, Oh, I read an article about it on the internet last night. My head hurt just thinking about this ghost thing. I made up my mind to prove or disprove it once and for all. I called my friend Laura and persuaded her to come with me to the grave. The following night, we met at the stroke of midnight at the entrance to the graveyard. Laura was shaking and constantly casting glances right and left. The weather was rainy and gloomy. The ground was muddy and cats were meowing everywhere. It would have made the perfect setting for a supernatural horror movie. While we were looking for Donna's grave, flying bats would occasionally startle Laura, causing her to scream alarmed. As we approached Donna's grave, we suddenly heard a sound behind us. We both turned around at the same time and screamed. A ghost was glaring at us. It asked angrily, What are you doing beside my grandmother's grave? Wait a minute. Are you girls? She uncovered her face, revealing that she was just a girl, and a beautiful one at that. She told us that her name was Carmen, and asked me to turn off the flashlight, because it hurt her eyes. I did. Then I asked, Who are you? She replied, I'm the fifth grandchild of Donna Median, the poor woman in this grave, who has been wrongly accused. We both whispered back, Wrongly accused? She continued saying, Yes, she was a victim of the Holocaust during World War II. Afterwards, she became a simple doctor who treated people who were afflicted with epilepsy. As usual, there are always some small-minded superstitious people looking to make trouble for others. They accused her of being a witch because they considered epilepsy to be a disease caused by a demon's touch. I come here every day to put flowers on her grave. People have mistaken me for a ghost because I only come at night. I don't want people to know I'm related to someone they think to be a witch. I don't want to be shunned, scorned, or gossiped about. I try to comfort her and calm her a little by saying, Don't worry, Carmen. Your grandmother's spirit may be able to rest in peace if you tell people the truth now. We live in more modern times, and when there's no need to worry, I won't tell anyone about you being the ghost. It'll be our little secret. Carmen laughed. She and I became good friends after that. Ever since that day, whenever I hear someone talking about ghosts, I just look at the photo I took of Carmen and I, and I break out laughing. My name is Ginny. You can call me Bad Girl if you like. That's what the neighborhood kids called me. I have a long story to tell you. I was the eldest of five siblings. My mother died of illness, and my father was crippled in a car accident. He couldn't walk, and he had to use a wheelchair. Seeing my siblings suffer from hunger and poverty, was a constant sight at home. My father was depressed. Our neighbors helped us a lot, but I was constantly worried what would happen if they ever stopped, so I decided to try and find a job. I knew it wouldn't be easy, because I was only 15. Who'd want to hire a 15-year-old? Though I was apprehensive and lacking confidence, I made up my mind to get a job. I went to many places, clothing shops, flower shops, grocery stores. The answer was the same. We're not hiring at the moment. One day, feeling down, I was walking aimlessly with no destination in mind, when suddenly I found myself near a hospital. On an impulse, I entered. I saw a nurse, but she seemed too gloomy to talk, so I looked around and found another nurse, who looked a bit kinder. She noticed me, and asked if I needed any help. I told her that I was looking for a job. Any job. I'd even mop and clean. She felt sympathy for me, and told me not to worry. Then, she went into the manager's office. I was worried. Was I in trouble? A minute later, she called me in to meet the manager. He seemed very kind, and he quietly asked for my name. I told him it was Ginny. He told me that Martha, the kind nurse who was helping me, told him that I was looking for any job available. He said he had a job for me, but he was concerned that it might be a problem. I felt a pang of fear, and asked what the problem was. He said that I would have to work night shifts. That was it? I felt so relieved. I immediately agreed, and he said that he liked my enthusiasm and that I could start tomorrow. I was so happy. I returned home quickly, hugged my siblings, and kissed my father's hands. I told them everything about my new job. My father looked at me sadly and said that I was too young to have to bear this responsibility. I told him that it was okay and that I could deal with it. When I went to work at the hospital every night, there was a gang of young kids who were always loitering around the neighborhood. 
I hoped they wouldn't bother me, but my hopes were in vain. They made fun of me every time I passed them. I never told my family about this, though. I began work as a cleaning lady, but due to my diligence and intelligence, I was able to learn a little bit about nursing. So, I was able to get promoted. First, to nursing assistant, then to a nurse. My colleagues supported me a lot. Everything was almost perfect, except for the neighborhood gang that was always bothering me and calling me Ginny the bad girl. I wished they would just go away and leave me alone. Then, one day, a miracle happened. While I was working at the hospital, the neighborhood bullies came in, carrying their leader. He was badly injured. His whole body was covered in blood. They were shouting for someone to help them, and when they saw me, they pleaded with me to save him. I worked quickly with the other staff. His condition was serious. He had been in a terrible motorcycle accident. The staff and I worked feverishly to stabilize his condition and treat him. After stabilizing him, I was exhausted. Suddenly, I felt someone coming close. It was the gang. They apologized for making fun of me and asked me to forgive them. They said they didn't know that I worked at a hospital. I smiled and told them it was okay and that I considered them to be my brothers and sisters. Another nurse went to them and told them that their friend was okay now. I was so happy that my problem was solved. They called me over to talk to their leader. He had tears in his eyes and told me that he was so sorry and asked me to forgive him. He was so sincere that I was moved. I gently asked him to be quiet and get some rest. As I was walking away, he called me and thanked me again. After that incident, the manager called me in and praised me for saving the patient's life that day. I was still a long way from achieving my dreams, but I had a good head start, and the neighborhood gang began calling me the Mercy Angel. I adore my family. I adore our get-togethers, our joking around, our meals, everything. I can't imagine my life without them, but one day I almost killed them all. No, I'm not insane, I assure you, so don't worry. I'll tell you what happened. My name is Ginger. I'm 18 years old. As you can see, I'm wearing an apron. This is because I love to cook. I like all things kitchen related. My happiest moments are when I see my family eating a meal together. I always cook for them. They enjoy it too. And they support me. They let me try different dishes from different countries. I like to listen to their opinions about my cooking skills. I'm also addicted to cooking programs. One day... My cousin Charlotte came to visit, before Thanksgiving Day. She likes to dress all in black, and today was no exception. For some reason, she had called me earlier and asked me if I had ever heard of Thanksgiving's Day curse. I said no, of course, so she told me that the curse applied to large families who ate a big meal together on Thanksgiving. The curse was the result of an evil spirit named Vicky, who would possess the cook's body in some family's household and poison the whole family. She said that Vicky used to be a housewife who was a great cook and who loved her family, and yet she poisoned them all during Thanksgiving meal. She watched them die one by one, and then she killed herself as the grand finale. At first, I thought Charlotte was joking and trying to scare me, and I told her that it was nonsense, just an old wife's tale. But she said that every legend was usually based on facts. I paused for a second. That was partly true. I went to my room and searched the internet and found the same information about the curse that she had relayed to me, which frightened me even more. Vicky was just like me, or was it the opposite? I stopped myself from getting deeper into this. I needed to focus on preparing the meal. On Thanksgiving's Day, my father bought some groceries, which included a white bottle of liquid. I presumed it to be milk, though it smelled a little weird, but I thought it was my imagination. My aunt called and said she would be arriving a few minutes later so I had to hurry and finish the meal quickly. My finishing touch was dessert. It was going to be pumpkin candy. I prepared it using the milk that Dad bought. After everyone had arrived, I served dinner. We all sat down and prayed before the meal. Then, everyone started eating. Things were going well. Everyone was chatting merrily and complimenting me on the food. I was overjoyed. But somehow, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong. I looked at Charlotte but she smiled supportively. Suddenly, one by one, the people around the table started clutching their stomachs and groaning in pain. The last thing I remember before I lost consciousness was my brother calling the ambulance. When I woke up later, I was lying in a hospital bed, alongside all my family members, who were also lying in the hospital bed. 
The doctor came in and reported happily that we would all be fine. Then he looked at me and winked. He also said, Next time, young lady, I suggest not using white paint in your cooking. And that was how I almost killed my loving family. I confess that I love money and fame. People envy me for it. Or they did. I've been a prima donna since the day I was born. All girls dreamt of being me. My father helped my brother and I achieve all our dreams. But there was one fly in the ointment. And this is my story. My name is Amelia. I'm 17 years old. My father's a businessman. And my mother came from a rich family. So we were quite wealthy. Rolling in dough, one might say. My brother Arthur was handsome. Older than me. He went to flight school. We lived a good life without a care in the world. We had everything. Cell phones, clothes, cars, servants, opportunities to travel the globe. We wanted for nothing. The most important thing was our happiness. And so my story starts at the villa, where I lived with my family. My father employed many servants to attend to our every need. Martha was our head servant. She was in her forties. Funny. Smart. Arthur and I loved her. Oddly, we didn't view her as a servant because she took such good care of us. Mother didn't seem to like her for some reason, and was always mistreating her. Father, however, adored Martha. Once I left my iPod in the garden, and I was going to get it. On my way to the garden, I passed by Father's office, so I decided to go and talk to him. He was at his desk, and Martha was standing next to him, crying. I figured it was because Mother had mistreated her again. Father saw me standing there, and he asked me why I was still awake, and I told him about my iPod. I didn't think much of it at the time. As time passed, Mother and Martha's disputes became more frequent every day. Father wasn't home a lot, but whenever he came home, he would always ask about Martha first. One time, when this happened, I noticed that Mother glared at Father. I couldn't understand why. Father was often away traveling for long periods of time. One of those times, I noticed that Martha was always tired because Mother was making her work very hard. Mother never let her relax. One day, after midnight, I went to Martha's room to check on her, and I was shocked to see that she looked different than I remembered. I asked if she was pregnant, and she said that she was, but that I shouldn't tell anyone, otherwise she'd get fired. I didn't understand why my parents would fire her for being pregnant. A few days later, we received some really horrible news. Father's plane had crashed, and there were no survivors. We were stunned. All of us were crying, but Martha was crying especially hard. Suddenly, Martha fainted, and we took her to the hospital. Our life had changed overnight. After the funeral, Father's lawyer called us about Father's will. He came to our home and met my mother, Arthur, me, and Martha, and two other servants. The lawyer began reading the will. He started with Mother's inheritance, then mine, then Arthur's, and then Martha's. He looked at Martha, cleared his throat, and said in a quiet voice, Martha, the deceased has left you ten million to raise your child. The lawyer read the last line of Father's will which said, Martha's child is mine. We all gasped, but Mother suddenly lost it. Enraged, she attacked Martha as the lawyer pulled Mother away from her. Arthur was holding his head in his hands, and I was shocked. I said to Martha, how dare you? How dare you do this to us? This is our money. You don't deserve any of it. Then I spoke to the lawyer. Please tell me this isn't true. He replied helplessly. Unfortunately, it is. Arthur was glaring at Martha, and he said coldly, Martha, you are going to die. Martha looked very frightened upon hearing this. That night, the other servants helped Martha sneak out of the house. Arthur came to my room that same night and told me that we had to kill Martha. He said he knew where she was and that her ten million belonged to us. At first, I was hesitant to get involved. I mean, that was murder, but in the end, I reluctantly agreed to help him. The next day, we made a call and hired a hitman to rid us of that disaster. Later, we received a call from him. He said that Martha was no longer a problem. We smirked in victory. A few days later, the lawyer came by again. Before he could tell us why he came, we beheld a miracle. Our recently said-to-be deceased father was walking behind him with a servant holding a child. Arthur and I stared at him in disbelief and shock. Then we looked at each other. Arthur's face had gone pale white as all the blood drained from his face. Father was livid, 
and said to us in an accusing manner, the moment you thought I was dead, and that I left an inheritance for Martha, you immediately arranged to have her killed. I suspected you'd try something like this. It was pure luck that I got back when I did. I missed my flight that day, otherwise I would have been dead now. So fortunately, I came back early enough for Martha to call me and tell me about your death threat. When I arrived at Martha's place, she was already dead, but I called 911, and they were able to save the child. Then I immediately called my lawyer to revise my will, to leave half of my inheritance to this child. I felt like I was in an endless nightmare. The police arrived and told us that the hired killer had been arrested and had confessed and told the police that Arthur and I were the ones who hired him to kill Martha. As the policeman was handcuffing us to take us away, I thought about the irony, how Martha was dead, how her newborn baby had survived and was now the richest child in the country, how Arthur and I were going to jail, and how one small fly in the ointment had caused our ultimate fall from grace.